here are the resources that will be available to you. We do have this text. It's called Modern Physics. This is a book that's written by a guy named Frederick Trinkline who teaches in a community college in a private high school in New York. Um, the reason that I'm not going to rely too heavily on this textbook is it's modern. And we live now in a postmodern world. And it's not really uh, the graphics, the way of approaching problems, and some of the things in there that are non-physics related are kind of out of date. It's a fairly old uh, textbook as textbooks go. So w once in a while I may have you do some problems or do some reading that I think might be particularly good, but most of the time the text is going to be ignored. You can choose to have one of these textbooks. You don't even have to check one out if you don't want to. We're going to have other ways of learning things, um, like notes. Right now what I'm doing for you is I'm providing you with some, some notes to help you learn and um, you're going to have these on pretty much a daily basis. Um, take the place of what you might read in the textbook and uh, be more interactive. You can't ask uh, Frederick Trinkline anything about physics because he might not even be alive anymore. And if he is, he's not there live in that textbook. But I will be. And uh, I can answer your questions as they come up um, or shortly after that. Uh, there will also be some web resources that I'll make you aware of and you can search these out on your own too. There are now hundreds of really good physics teachers, probably better physics teachers than me, have resources out there on YouTube, TeacherTube, and a gazillion other places on the on the internet that you can feel free to access. However you can learn this stuff, I want you to be able to do that. So I'm going to make you aware of the things that I know that are good and you can find other things on your own. Here's a rundown of uh, how the class is going to go. Unit 1, I've entitled Motion 1. Uh, motion is a pretty big topic. It's going to take us a lot of time. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, describe motion. We're going to find graphical ways, you know, mathematical model ways of describing motion. So here's this ball, and this ball is rolling down this hill. How can we describe that in a precise way? And then we're going to move on beyond description to explaining motion. So the ball rolls down the hill. Why does the roll, ball roll down the hill? We might, in description, have some good idea of what is its speed or velocity. We might know that. We might know what kind of distance it covers. We might know how long it, uh, how in terms of time, it's rolling. But what's the relationship between these things? And what makes the motion occur? So we're going to develop some relationships between things like velocity or speed, distance, time, and things called acceleration and force we're going to learn about too to explain why motion occurs the way it does. And one of the things that causes a lot of motion around a big planet like ours is gravity. So we're going to spend some time talking about, about gravity. What are the things that affect gravity? That'll be mo motion unit one. And that'll take us a while. Uh, we're going to kind of warm up going through this unit and you'll get used to the workload and used to the, the rigor of thinking that you may not be used to. So that'll bring us up to unit two where we're ready for more complex systems. We're going to look at that motion that's going not just in a straight line, but motions that, motion that's going maybe in two dimensions. So you will have an X and a Y. And for people that really want to get into it, we can also think about real life three-dimensional motion. And how can we describe motion that's going on in more than one direction? Here are several simple examples of that that we'll, that we'll study. Say you shoot a bullet. The bullet doesn't go in a straight line. The bullet has two components to its path. It not only goes forward, but it also drops. How can we explain a complex system like that? Or if you shoot uh, an arrow in the air or shoot a bullet in the air or throw a basketball, same thing. You've got an object that now has motion in two directions and you have to compensate for or be able to explain somehow how it's going to act in both of those directions. And then we're going to look at something called momentum. Um, it's a word that's in common use, but we're going to define it precisely. It has to do with um, how much something weighs and how fast it's moving. That's momentum. In fact, really very simply, I mean, momentum is just the, the product of the mass 
and the velocity of an object. So a big heavy object that's moving slow may not have as much momentum as a small object that's moving very rapidly. And we can use momentum as a problem solving tool to help us solve some motion problems. Unit 2 will be shorter than Unit 1, and then we'll move on to Unit 3, which is about mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is all the kinds of energy that are not involved in just making things get hot or cool down as energy flows from one object to another. That's thermal energy. We'll study that later. Um, there's sort of a fictitious division between mechanical energy that, that teachers make. So I'm going to put some quotes here. Kinetic energy is one way that energy can be stored. It's stored in the energy of motion, and we'll study that. And then there's another kind of energy. It's really the same thing. It's just a potential. But um, potential energy is, is energy that's stored in the positions of objects. I don't like these two words, but I fall into the trap of using them because that's how I've been taught. Kinetic energy I would prefer to call energy of motion. And potential energy, I think, should be called energy of position. It's much more descriptive of what's really going on. Energy is conserved. Mechanical energy is conserved in a perfect world. We don't live in a perfect world, but by pretending we do, we can solve a lot of problems and get really close to the right answer based on this idea of conservation of energy. Energy is conserved, this idea says, and so all the kinetic energy that you start with and all the potential energy you start with added up has to be what you end with after any kind of change. And so conservation of energy, this idea becomes a very uh, powerful problem-solving tool. And in fact, you can then solve some motion problems that you wouldn't be able to solve or that would be very difficult to solve using the tools that you learned in Unit 1 and Unit 2. And then we're going to discuss work and power, which a lot of people don't really know what they mean or think they mean the same thing. There are precise definitions for work and power. We're going to find out what they are, and you'll get to get to know what a foot pound and a, and a newton meter and a horsepower and all these things that people throw around, these terms that people throw around, you'll get to know what they actually mean. Unit 4 is almost a chemistry unit. It's kind of a little dip into the study of matter. We're going to look first of all at the atomic model uh, the idea that everything is made up of these little bits that are constantly moving around and they have attractions for each other. Uh, we call them atoms. The atoms are grouped into sometimes clusters called ions or, or molecules. That idea explains almost everything we know about how matter behaves. We're going to look at the states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. I just understand from this summer they discovered another state of matter. I'll have to find out what that is, see if I can explain it to you. And then we're going to look at how things go from change from one state to another, how changes in state occur, from liquid to solid, or solid to liquid, or liquid to gas, or whatever. That'll be a little interlude, a little chemistry stuck in our physics, and then we'll get back to looking at energy. In Unit 5, we're going to look at thermal energy, uh, the energy of all those little particles that you know, we studied in chemistry that are jiggling back and forth. We're going to look at how that back and forth jiggling uh, affects things. And uh, then we're also going to look at how does the energy, the thermal energy, get transferred from one object to the other and why? And is there a way to describe it and make predictions about it? So that'll be thermal energy. And then we're going to also look at how thermal energy affects state changes. Unit 6 will be about periodic change. Uh, there are some changes that are just random and unpredictable. There are some changes that are just steady, like the ball rolls down a hill and just never stops until it gets to the bottom. But then there are some other changes that go through cycles, uh, like vibrations and waves. If I just vibrate something, just move something back and forth, that's a vibration, a wiggle in time, some people call it. But if I start moving that wiggle, I develop what's called a, a wave. So vibrations and waves are periodic. In other words, they occur with some regular frequency from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, steady, steady amount of time. That's periodic change. So we'll study vibrations and waves. Um, another thing that does periodic change is a pendulum. So you know, you take a look at 
a ball or like a yo-yo on the end of a string to let that thing swing to this position, let it come back. Well, that's that's a periodic motion. So maybe some of the same mathematics that's used to describe waves and vibes could also be used to explain pendula. Maybe there's a connection. And then you have other things that aren't vibes or waves that are periodic. Like, let's take, ex for example, if you have a, a shaft with a wheel on it, and that thing is going around and around, which is very common in mechanical systems like cars and engines. As that thing spins around and around and around, it's doing these revolutions in a regular period. Well, there isn't any reason to believe that some of the mathematics about waves and vibes might not apply to that as well. So we'll take a look at those kinds of systems. We're going to look at something called resonance. When you vibrate something back and forth, it has its own characteristic way that it sort of wants to uh, vibrate. If you disturb it at exactly that same, that same frequency with that exactly that same pattern, you can get crazy things to happen, like the whole bridge might collapse, as has happened by poor design sometimes in history. And then a good example, a good real-life example that's fairly understandable of a periodic change, a wave actually, that's caused by a vibe, is sound. And so we're going to take a look at sound and how sound behaves. Unit 7 is a long shot. We often don't get to electricity and magnetism. It'd be nice if we if we did, but it all depends on how fast the class can move and things like that. Electricity and magnetism uh, is a kind of a big topic. It's a good one to wrap up. Even if we start it, we may not good chance we won't finish it. We're going to start out looking at electrical charge in this unit. What is it exactly that makes a positive and a negative pole of a battery what they are? And then we're going to look at the fields, electrical fields and magnetic fields that are generated by these um, kind of non-contact forces, these invisible forces. They're, they demonstrate themselves in fields or show themselves in fields. We'll study those a little bit. We'll talk about something called electrical potential. If you were an electrician, you wouldn't call it potential. You would call it voltage after the measurement unit that we used to measure potential. And then we'll talk about electrical current. Again, if you were an electrician, you wouldn't say current. You would say amps. Once again, uh, after the the current unit, which is the ampere. So potential and current are both forms of energy. This is like potential energy, and this is like kinetic energy, only for electricity. We'll study how those things uh, show themselves to us in various systems. And then we'll put together our knowledge of basic electricity to look at some, some devices that are commonly created, like transistors and resistors and... Um, batteries, capacitors, other devices like that, and how they can be assembled together to make electrical circuits that can actually uh, work as our slaves in a way and uh, perform things, little tricks with electrons that'll entertain us or whatever. Magnetism will be our next unit of study, and then we'll look at uh, electrical or and magnetic waves. It turns out electrical waves and magnetic waves travel together and they make this thing called an electromagnetic wave. So if you have a vibration going like in the plane of the screen here and then you have another one that's 90 degrees from that. This is a really poor picture of that. Um, there are better pictures on the internet that are available by people who can actually draw. <laughs> Those EM waves when they are combined make what we call electromagnetic energy. And an example of electromagnetic energy is light. Light behaves as a wave. Light also has other ways that it shows itself to us. So we're going to take a look at light, and that'll be the last thing that we get to. Well, thanks for uh, sitting through this. Gives you an idea of what you're in for uh, throughout the course of this year. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be good. It's going to be a good kind of hard, and I'm here to help.